In this presentation, we will now finish up this week's block of scripture of now discussing things in 1 Corinthians chapter 4 through chapter 7. 1 Corinthians 4, Christ ministers. 1 Corinthians 4, 1, ministers of God and stewards of the mysteries of God. Leading administrators, holding the priesthood, called and commissioned by Christ to present him, to stand in his place, and stead in teaching the gospel and performing the ordinances of salvation, are ministers of Christ. Joseph Smith stated, Salvation cannot come without revelation. It is vain for anyone to minister without it. No man is a minister of Jesus Christ without being a prophet. Let me just break. And what he means by that is in Revelations chapter 19, verse 10, where it says the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. So without being a prophet, without having a testimony of Jesus Christ is what he means. Now back to Joseph Smith. Men of the present time testify of heaven and hell and have never seen either. And I will say that no man knows these things without this. Thus, true ministers receive revelation, which revelation reveals the mysteries of God, meaning knowledge of God and his gospel that are unknown. 1 Corinthians 4, verses 2 through 7. Paul's explaining that as steward and having received revelation, as a steward and having received revelation, I have been faithful, nevertheless you have judged me. But that is of no moment. I do not even judge myself, nor would I be justified in doing so doing, though I am not aware of any fault, for judgment is the Lord's. I pass judgment on none of you until the Lord comes. Then he shall reveal your hidden acts and make manifest what is in your hearts. Then shall those who are saints be rewarded. I speak of myself and of Apollos, but the principle applies to all of you. You must learn not to think too highly of men simply because they have gained the wisdom of the world. After all, where did they get the ability to excel? For that matter, what have any of us that did not come from God? And if something comes by inheritance as a gift, why should we boast or glory about having it? Sorry about the typo. That should be we instead of be. 1 Corinthians, for minister of Christ. 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 7. Paul now tries to explain why people have different abilities or gifts. One man sings, another preaches, one has athletic prowess, another is intellectual giant, one solves mathematical problems, another composes music, one is spiritually inclined, another is, about to, uh, is as receptive to the spirit of revelation as, as a pine board. Why? It is primarily a matter of pre-existence. All men trained themselves for an infinite period in the schools of eternity before birth into mortality. Men came here with the talents and capacities developed there. Why then, Paul asked, should any man boast because of God-given gifts? 1 Corinthians 4.8 it appears that Paul warns how some have turned to the enticings of the wealth and riches of the world. He counsels the saints that it is better to reign as kings and priests in God's hierarchy, which God counsels in D&C 6-7. Seek not for riches, but for wisdom. And behold, the mysteries of God shall be unfolded unto you, and then ye shall be made rich. Behold, he hath the eternal life is rich. 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 9-10, through 10, Death of the Apostles. When Paul taught that the apostles were appointed unto death, 1 Corinthians 4, 9, he hinted that his calling as an apostle would lead to his death. He also related that many in Corinth viewed themselves as being wise and strong while considering Paul and other apostles to be foolish, weak, and despised, 1 Corinthians 4, 10. These two factors, the apostles' death and church members' rejection of apostolic authority, would ultimately contribute to the great apostasy. 
President Henry B. Iron, the first presidency, taught that if the saints who hear Paul had possessed a testimony of the value and the power of the keys he held, perhaps the apostles would not had to have been taken from the earth. Paul wanted the people to feel the value of the chain of priesthood keys reaching from the Lord through his apostles to them, the members of the Lord's church. First Corinthians 4 verse 9, Apostles. An apostle is a special witness of the name of Christ who is sent to teach the principles of salvation to others. He is one who knows of the divinity of the Savior by personal revelation and who is appointed to bear testimony to the world of what the Lord has revealed to him. Every elder in the church is or should be an apostle, that is, as a minister of the Lord and as a recipient of personal revelation from the Holy Ghost. Every elder has the call to bear witness of the truth on all proper occasions. Indeed, every member of the church should have apostolic insight and revelation and is under obligation to raise the warning voice. Doctrine and Covenants 88.1, Mosiah 18.9. <clears throat> Another definition of apostle is, in the ordained sense, an apostle is one who obtained to the office of apostle in a Melchizedek priesthood. Ordinarily, those so ordained are also set apart as members of the Council of the Twelve and are given all the keys of the kingdom of the God on earth. This apostleship carries the responsibility of proclaiming the gospel in all the world and also to administering the affairs of the church. Christ chose twelve whom he also named apostles, and upon their shoulders the burden of the kingdom rests after he ascended to his Father. 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 1, 6, 8, and 9. In these verses, Paul uses the word or phrase us, or us the apostles. Paul and Apollo are named, Apollos are named, and all of the apostles are included. Does this then mean that Apollos had become one of the council of the twelve? Such appears to be the case. Great hosts of the early brethren were apostles in the sense of being special witnesses of the Lord, of having the Spirit certify to their souls the fact of his divine sonship. But the whole context of Paul's presentation here indicates that he is speaking of members of the Twelve as the ministers of Christ and not of, general witnesses, uh, not of witnesses in general. 1 Corinthians 4, 11 through 13. Paul now addresses trials and persecutions the apostles have had to bear. Every dispensation has its own crosses to bear. Noah's day alone saw the flood. Abraham's only saw fire from heaven destroy great cities. Only on Moses' day were the Lord's people called upon to wander for 40 years in the wilderness. And only in the times meridian were persecution and martyrdom singled out as among the chief identifying marks of membership in God's earthly kingdom. The dispensation of the meridian of time was the dispensation of martyrdom, the dispensation of crucifixion, the dispensation when God himself, as well as hosts of those who enlisted in his cause, were slain by wicked men. In all ages, the saints have been persecuted by the world. But in the days of Jesus and Paul, the world went wild, persecution was perfected, and the blood of the martyrs under the altar cried unto the Lord for vengeance. 1 Corinthians 4, verses 14 through 21. Verses 14 through 15, Paul is saying, I write not to shame you, but to admonish you, and I have the right to do so, for I am your spiritual father because of being spiritually begotten of Christ and the covenants of the gospel you have made. Verses 16 and 7, he is saying, Follow my, my example, therefore, and attend to the instructions of Timothy, whom I sent to remind you of my teachings. Verse 18, he's saying, 
Some of you have been indulging oneself in pride with an obvious or vain display of self-satisfaction on your attainments and posing as authorities, as if I were never to return to you. Verses 19 and 20, he is saying, Do not deceive yourself. I shall soon be with you to test not the words of those authority, authorities, but their power. For the kingdom of God is advanced not by empty words, but by, spirit, <clears throat> but by spiritual power. Oh, how this truth needs to be thundered into the ears of every living soul. The kingdom of God on earth, the church of Jesus Christ, the gospel of salvation are not found in the world, but in the word, but in power. It matters not that a people have the word of God, that is the Bible is open before them, that they have a record of what God and angels have said, that they know what the doctrines of salvation are. There is no salvation in these things standing alone. Of course men must have the word. Of course they must learn the doctrines of salvation. But men do not gain the kingdom of God, the church, or the gospel until they possess the power. The gospel is the power of God unto salvation. There must be priesthood, the gifts of the Holy Ghost, revelations, visions, miracles, glories, manifestations of God's power, or there is no kingdom of God, no church of Jesus Christ, no saving gospel. Where God's power is manifest, there is the church and the kingdom of God on earth. And where there is, his power is not found, there the church is not. In verse 21, he's saying, The spirit in which I shall come depends upon yourselves. If you continue in your evil course, I will act with severity. If you repent, I shall be gentle and encouraging. 1 Corinthians 5, Why the Church Cannot Fellowship Sinners In 1 Corinthians 5, 1-13, Put away from among, among yourselves that wicked person. The word fornication was translated from the Greek pornea, which refers to any sexual relations outside of marriage. Por, pornea is also the root word for pornography. One instance of fornication that Paul had learned of involved a church member in Corinth who was in a sexual relationship with his stepmother. Such a relationship was forbidden in the law of Moses and was viewed as being wrong even among non-Christians. Paul reproved the church in Corinth for failing to take disciplinary measures against the sinning member and he canceled that the sinner be put away or excommunicated from the congregation. 1 Corinthians 5.13 Paul reasoned that if the transgressor were left in the church, the influence of wickedness was spread throughout the church by comparing it to leaven. As in Paul's day, church members today are sometimes excommunicated for sinful behavior. Formal church councils carry out disciplinary actions, always with the goal of helping and saving the sinner by assisting him or her in the repentance process. Elder M. Russell Ballard, the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles, taught, In the scriptures, the Lord has given direction concerning church disciplinary counsel. The word counsel brings to mind a helpful proceeding, one of love and concern, with the salvation blessings of the transgressor being the foremost consideration. Members sometimes ask why church disciplinary councils are held. The purpose is threefold. One, to save the souls of the transgressor, two, to protect the innocent, and three, to safeguard the church's purity, integrity, and good name. The miracle of the gospel is that we all can repent. Church government calls for church disciplinary councils, but the Lord's system also calls for restoration following repentance. This fellowship or excommunication is not the end of the story unless the member so chooses. 1 Corinthians 15, 11 through 13. Here Paul is saying that we should not do what gross sinners do, nor be influenced by them, nor spend our time going to the places they frequent. We should admonish sinners and love them, but stay away from their evil ways. Paul also says it is not his or the church's business to judge and regulate the whole world, 
but rather to keep the church pure and leave the world to God. Neil A. Maxwell, the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles, expanded on this teaching, pointing out that even a good person cannot remain unaffected by unrighteous influences. Do not company with fornicators, not because you are too good for them, but as C.S. Lewis wrote, because you are not good enough. Remember that bad situations can wear down even good people. Joseph had both good sense and good legs and fleeing from Potiphar's wife. 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 5. Less than 20 verses further on in this same epistle, Paul is going to say in language that cannot be gainsaid that fornicators cannot inherit the kingdom of God. But in this case, he holds out hope of salvation on certain conditions. Why? This is perhaps the most deep, difficult, and little-known doctrine in the church, one that is wholly unknown in the world. From Latter-day Revelation, we learn that following celestial marriage, that would be temple, a man may make his calling and election sure, that is, he may progress in righteousness until he is sealed up unto eternal life and his exaltation is guaranteed. Such is the state to which Isaiah, Ezekiel, Joseph Smith, Paul himself, and others attained. A person in this state is subject to the law to which Paul here merely alludes, but which is given and more amplified from in the Doctrine and Covenants in these words. Verily, verily, I say unto you, if a man marry a wife according to my word, and if their calling and election is made sure, and they are sealed by the Holy Spirit of promise according to my appointment, and he or she shall commit any sin or transgression of the new and everlasting covenant, whatever, and all manner of blasphemies, and if they commit no murder wherein, wherein they shed innocent blood, yet they shall come forth in the first res resurrection and enter into their exaltation. But they shall be destroyed in the flesh, and shall be delivered unto the buffetings of Satan, unto the day of redemption, saith the Lord. That would be a high price to pay to be delivered over to Satan and his buffetings while in the flesh. Let's go to 1 Corinthians chapter 6. 1 Corinthians 6, 1 through 7, avoiding legal disputes with fellow saints. One of the causes for division among church members in Corinth was that the Christians were bringing fellow church members before civil magistrates over trivial civil pursuits. Paul counseled church members to seek to resolve their differences among themselves rather than entering a lawsuit against a fellow member. Paul's counsel reflects similar teachings that the Savior gave during his mortal ministry. Modern-day scripture acknowledges that there are times when it may be appropriate for church members to pursue solutions to legal problems through the law of the land. Doctrine and Covenants 42, 78 through 89. Verse 2 and the two following verses are written sarcastically. They were puffed up with, they were, the Corinthians puffed up with spiritual pride. Chapter 5, verse 2. And in their conceit and vanity had spoken of their hope to judge both men. Chapter 5, verse 12. Chapter 6, verse 3. And angels. Chapter 6, verse 3. If this be their expectation, says the apostles, surely they are capable, even the meanest of them, of judging in matters of daily life. To take these expressions about the saints judging the world and angels seriously is to miss the point of the apostle's argument. Besides, he has already said that the Christians, both he and they, had nothing to do with judging the world, which was God's part. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 9 through 7, I'm sorry, 9 through 11. The unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God. In 1 Corinthians 6, 9-10, the Apostle Paul warned that those who persist in sinful behavior will not inherit God's kingdom. Note that in verse 9, the Greek phrase translates as effeminate, and abusers of themselves with mankind refer to homosexual relations and pedophilia. 
All forms of sexual immorality are contrary to God's law. However, God provides the opportunity for forgiveness to those who truly repent. Paul taught that some who had been guilty of sexual sins had repented and were now washed clean and justified in the name of the Lord, 1 Corinthians 6.11. Regarding Paul's teaching about immoral behavior, it is important to remember that as President Gordon B. Hinckley stated, we cannot condone the sin, but we love the sinner. 1 Corinthians 6, 12-20 and 10-23, what is meant by all things are lawful. In 1 Corinthians 6, 12 and 10-23, Paul seems to address a false idea in Corinthian society that all things were lawful or that everything is permissible. The Joseph Smith translation clarifies that Paul refuted the notion that all things were lawful. And now here's the quote of the Joseph Smith translation. It says, All things are not lawful unto me, and all things are not expedient. All things are not lawful for me, therefore I will not be brought under the power of any. We cannot do anything we want and be considered clean and pure before God. 1 Corinthians 6, 13-20, flee fornication. Paul taught that those who join the church become one with Christ as spiritual members of his body. He explained that sinful behavior, particularly the act of being joined to a harlot, was incomp incompatible with the spiritual relationship or oneness with Jesus Christ. Church leaders today continue to emphasize the importance of revering sexual intimacy before marriage. For the Strength of the Youth booklet, it says, Before marriage, do not participate in passionate kissing, lying on top of one another, or touching the private sacred parts of another person's body, with or without clothing. Do not do anything else that arouse sexual feelings. Do not arouse those emotions in your own body. Paul here decries the Corinthian claim that as the hunger of the belly is properly satisfied with food, so sexual appetites might properly be fed with fornication. Rather, he acclaims, the bodies of the saints are eternal and will be resurrected as a part of the spiritual body of Christ. They must not be defiled by connection with harlots. They are now Christ, for he has bought them with his blood and made them temples wherein his spirit may dwell, since he owns them. We are not our own brothers and sisters. Christ owns us. He justly decrees that they shall be used in righteousness. Your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost. Elder D. Todd Christopherson, the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles, highlighted the importance of respecting our bodies. Those who believe that our bodies are nothing more than the result of evolutionary chance will feel no accountability to God or anyone else for what they do with or to do with or to their body. We who have a witness of the broader reality of premortal, mortal and postmortal eternity, however, must acknowledge that we have a duty to God to respect to this crowning achievement of his physical creation. In Paul's words, what know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost which is in you, which ye have of God? And ye are not your own, for ye are bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. Acknowledge these truths. We would certainly not deface our bodies as with tattoos or debilitating it as with drugs or defile it as with fornication, adultery, or immodesty. As our bodies is the instrument of our spirit, it is vital that we care for it as best we can. We should consecrate its powers to serve and further the work of Christ. Said Paul, I beseech you therefore, brethren, be by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies as living sacrifices, wholly acceptable unto God. 1 Corinthians 6.20, you are bought with a price. Elder Jeffrey R. Holland of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles explained how we were purchased 
through the Savior's merciful sacrifice. He said, The Savior's spiritual suffering and the shedding of his blood, so lovingly and freely given, paid the debt for what the scriptures call the original guilt of Adam's transgression. Furthermore, Christ suffered for the sins and sorrows and pains of all the rest of the human family, providing remission for all of our sins as well upon conditions of obedience to the principles and ordinances of the gospel he taught. As the Apostle Paul wrote, we were bought with a price. What an expensive price. What a merciful purchase. Brothers and sisters, the royal blood of heaven, the literal blood of Jesus Christ, has purchased every one of us. We will be eternally indebted to him. 1 Corinthians 7, marriages, Marriage and Missionary Service. In 1 Corinthians 7, 1 through 40, questions about marriage while sexual immorality was common in ancient Corinth, some people there held the opposite belief that it was good for a man not to touch a woman, and therefore one should refrain from all sex relations, even in marriage. Paul's words of counsel, I would that all men were even as myself, and it is good for them if they abide even as I, 1 Corinthians 7, 7 through 8, have led some to mistakenly believe that Paul was unmarried and promoted the celibate lifestyle as being superior to marriage. However, Paul probably was married or had been at some point. Most scholars acknowledge that Paul was either a member of the Jewish ruling party, the Sanhedrin, or a close associate of the group. To comply with the Sanhedrin's membership requirements, Paul would have had to be married. Even if Paul was simply a representative of the Sanhedrin, he would have been expected to be in harmony with all accepted Jewish customs and therefore be married. In addition, Paul clearly taught the importance of marriage and family life. Many of Paul's instructions in this chapter were likely meant to help members understand that marriage was appropriately delayed for full-time missionary service, just like we teach today. This chapter seems to be about going on a mission should I not be married? If I am married, should I get a divorce? Uh, and such things. The Joseph Smith translation supports this conclusion. Here is Joseph Smith's translation. Joseph Smith said, but I, or, or translated, but I speak unto you who are called unto the ministry. For this I say, brethren, the time that remaineth is short, that ye shall be sent forth unto the ministry. Even they who have wives shall be as though they had none, meaning even some who are married will be called as missionaries. For they are called and chosen to do the Lord's work. But I would, brethren, that ye magnify your calling. I would have you, I would have you without carefulness. For he who is unmarried care for the things that belong to the Lord, how he may please the Lord, therefore he prevaileth. But he who is married careth for the things of the world, how he may please his wife. Therefore, there is a difference. He is hindered. All he is saying that it is harder to go on a full-time mission and leave your spouse because your mind would be upon her, which would be natural. That it's a lot easier to serve without being married so that you're not hindered and worried and concerned about your family at home. 1 Corinthians 7, verses 1 through 5, Intimacy in Marriage. We do not know all of the questions Paul was answering in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, 1 through 5. However, it is evident that some people whom Paul taught thought that celibacy was preferred to marriage. See 1 Corinthians 7, 1. It seems that some also believed that complete abstinence should be practiced even by married people. In response, Paul taught that sexual intimacy in marriages, in marriage is an important way for husbands and wives to show love and affection. This principle is also taught in the church. Physical intimacy between husband and wife is a beautiful and sacred. 
It is ordained of God for the creation of children and for the expression of love between husband and wife. God has commanded that sexual intimacy be reserved for marriage. See for the strength of you, page 35. We all have a sexual nature, and marriage is the solution. Sex is not just for having children. It is also to create emotional bonding between husband and wife. Each has an obligation to meet the other's spiritual needs and should not deprive the other unless both agree to abstain for a time and then resume sexual relations so that Satan will be less effective in presenting outside distractions and temptations. Additionally, Paul encouraged spouses to render due benevolence, 1 Corinthians 7, 3, to one another. Due benevolence does not refer to one spouse may demand of another in marriage. Rather, it refers to the love, respect, and affection married couples can provide one to another. President Howard W. Hunter provided the following counsel regarding intimacy in marriage. He said, Tenderness and respect, never selfishness, must be the guiding principle in the intimate relationship between husband and wife. Each partner must be considerate and sensitive to the other's needs and desires. Any domineering, indecent, or uncontrolling behavior in the intimate relationship between husband and wife is condemned by the Lord. 1 Corinthians 7, 6-7 Having announced that marriage is honorable in all, and the bed undefiled, Paul is now going to give it as his personal opinion that in some cases, exceptions may be made. I would that all men were as even as I myself, meaning I would that all men understood the law of marriage, that all had self-mastery over their appetites, and that all obeyed the law of God in this respect. 1 Corinthians 7, 8-9 some translations set up a misleading comparison as the following examples. Remain single as I do. That's from the Revised Standard Version. Remain unattached as I am. That's from the Phillips Translation. Stay unmarried as I am. That's from the New International Version. The Greek te text simply does not say this. <clears throat> Twice the comparison is made even as I myself, verse 7, or even as I, verse 8. Any hint of whether or not Paul is married does not come from these verses. The earlier one, verse 7, is strongly used to say that Paul has the gift of self-control, verse 5. So both verses are asking the saints to follow Paul, exemplifying that quality. Such instruction is appropriate for the married or unmarried. Paul here gives a personal opinion that in some cases about which the Corinthians had asked, unmarried persons and widows should not marry. We do not know to whom the instructions were here given apply. In any event, they are an exception to the law, and they do not apply, even as a personal opinion, to others than those involved. 1 Corinthians 7, 10 through 11. In whatever cases are here involved, the Lord counsels against divorce, and Paul gives a personal opinion that such divorces occur, women should remain unmarried. 1 Corinthians 7, 12-19, Unbelieving Spouses Paul counsels members who were married to unbelievers not to divorce their spouses on the grounds of their unbelief, but to remain married and live as faithful followers of Christ. In doing so, a marriage partner can become the means of sanctifying the unbelieving spouse. In 1832, as the prophet Joseph Smith was asking to better understand 1 Corinthians 4, 7.14, he received the revelation recorded in Doctrine and Covenants section 74, which provides the important context for the problem Paul was address, uh, addressing. So here is Doctrine and Covenants, section 74, 1 through 7. The Lord said, concerning 1 Corinthians 7, 12 through 9, For the unbelieving husband is, is sanctified by the wife, and the unbelieving wife is sanctified by the husband. Else were your children unclean, but now they are holy. Now in the days of the apostles, 
The law of circumcision was had among the Jews, who believed not the gospel of Jesus Christ. And it came to pass that there arose a great contention among the people concerning the law of circumcision. For the unbelieving husband was desirous that his children should be circumcised and become subject to the law of Moses, which was fulfilled. This is obviously referring to if the unbelieving husband was a Jew, was Jewish. Back to the, uh, the verse. And it came to pass that the children being brought up in subjection to the law of Moses gave heed to the tradition of their fathers and believed not the gospel of Christ, wherein they became holy. Wherefore, for this cause, the apostle wrote unto the church, giving unto them a commandment, not of the Lord, but of himself, that a believer should not be united to an unbeliever, except the law of Moses should be done away among them that their children might remain without circumcision, and that the tradition might be done away, which saith that little children are unholy, for it was had among the Jews. But little children are holy, being sanctified through the atonement of Jesus Christ. And this is what the scriptures mean. 1 Corinthians 7, 20-24 Both slaves and freemen join the church, but such does not itself change their legal status. It is not, however, right that men should be slaves. 1 Corinthians 7, 25-40 Paul here continues to answer questions on marriage which were posed by his Corinthian fellow saints. It is clear from the inspired version corrections and additions that ministerial service or a missionary nature was involved. And the main question seems to be, should engaged persons who are called on a mission marry first or go out on the Lord's errand while single? And if they should serve while single, should certain ones who are already married receive divorces prior to such service? In our day, when an elder who is engaged to be married is called on a mission, more often than not he fulfills his mission prior to his marriage. Occasionally he marries first and leaves his wife for the assignment assigned period of ministerial service. In the early days of this dispensation, recently married brethren were frequently called to leave their wives and perform missionary service. Obviously, the same rule need not and should not apply in every case. A host of personal circumstances and situations are always involved. Ordinarily, and Paul specified this as his opinion, marriage should be deferred. Thank you for watching. If you enjoyed the presentation, hit the like button and consider subscribing to the channel.